Welcome to Finite Element Methods. We'll be discussing plate elements. And my goal in this particular lecture is not to go into an extensive theory. I'll just cover the top level view because in this case, I think what we want to do is really learn how to use the approach, the, the, this type of elements, not necessarily go into the deep level theory. And there's a homework on launch vehicle design, a project where you can then learn how to use these elements. We've had other problems where you use these elements, but I'm showing you some of the background behind it. So you understand what these elements are about. What, what are plates and shells? Plates and shells are thin in one direction. Very thin in this direction can be longer in the other direction. Take the aircraft skin. The aircraft skin is pretty long in two directions, along the length of the aircraft, circumferentially, but very thin in that thickness direction. So plate elements are perfect. We don't have to model the thickness in 3D. That would be computationally too expensive. But if we can model that plate, that shell, just using, uh, just following that mid-surface, that, that is a good thing. Plate and shell bending deformations can be expressed in terms of the deformations of their mid-surface. Shell elements are typically used to model curved surfaces, and we will derive the equations for thick plates really quickly, which we call this mindling plates. In my book, I go into an extensive derivation with an example problem. But for this particular lecture, I want to just, again, touch the top level view. The 3D structural representation of a plate looks like this, but we're going to just track that mid-surface that you see here in red dashed line. And here, there's a problem here with this. Just ignore this triangle on the right-hand side. I apologize. But look at this mid-surface I'm extracting out of here. And what I want to do, I want to solve the equations over the mid-surface here. Very similar to what we did for the beam. The mid-beam, we're modeling a neutral axis as a wire, ele wire element. And that's representing a 3D cross-section in 3D length. But here, again, we're just following the mid-surface alone. And that's what we're going to be analyzing. Here you can see uh, the 3D structure model with three, uh, three elements through the thickness. And you can see that if I just model the, uh, uh, using plate elements, tracking the mid surface of that 3D solid, the deflections are very similar. But this is competition, competitionally more expensive because here I have three elements through the thickness. And here I just don't have that. It's just simple. Um, element that can be used for modeling uh, bending behavior. Now, if I were to use one solid element through a thickness, that is going to cause uh, the solution not to converge as well. So I have to increase the number of elements through a thickness, and that will be much more advantageous. What are the deflections? And I don't want to necessarily for you to learn every single theory here. I have a lecture in composites, a video lecture you can go and check, which goes into this uh, theory in a lot more detail. What I want you to understand is the top level view, what is going on and how this theory generally works. Here, the deflection U, V, and W across the whole 3D structure, X, Y, and Z, is expressed in terms of the deflections of the mid-surface that you see here. So this mid-surface is tracked. So this deflection on that mid-surface, uh, uh, this deflection is along the X direction, this deflection is along the Y direction, and this deflection is through the thickness, U, V, and W. CX and CY are the rotations, <clears throat> or the basically the rotations uh, about the X and Y axes. And Z here has been explicitly defined, similar to what we did with beam theory. So UMV, we're assuming that UMV uh, basically are going to vary linearly through the thickness. That's the assumption being made here, very similar to beam theory when we covered the Timoshenko beam theory. Notice how UV and W, CX and CY, only depend on X and Y. So that's why it's called a two-dimensional theory. In my book, I have it there as well. So 
if these are the deflection assumptions, I'm ready to determine the strains. And the strains can be calculated using these formulas. Partial U respect to X plus Z respect to partial X respect, respect to X. And how do I found this? So I know that the epsilon XX is partial of U respect to X. So partial of U respect to X. Well, that's partial U not respect to X plus Z partial CX respect to X. Easy. Epsilon Y is a partial V respect to Y plus Z and then partial CY respect to Y. Okay. And how do I find gamma XY? Gamma XY, and you can find that through this equation, is partial U. So partial U respect to Y plus partial V respect to X. So then I have to apply this, substitute that into that formula. And this is what this is what we will get, and I can repeat the uh, the 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 gamma x y z and gamma x z, and this is what I'll get. Notice how these are constants, right? This varies across the thickness, but this does not vary across the thickness. That's constant because w does not depend on z, and c does not depend on z. So very simple. The strain displacement relationships can be found very easily now. So I can rearrange all these equations in a convenient form, as you see here, plus Z times that. Uh, and these are the five strains. This whole thing uh, is this, and this whole thing is this kappa as you see here. We call this the curvature terms. I'm just writing in this manner because it's simpler to see. You can see that these are the membrane strains and these are the curvatures. So these are the strains. Again, instead of modeling the 3D behavior, we're just following the mid-surface. You can see here the advantage of that. We can determine the deflection very accurately. Stresses won't be that bad. Strains won't be that bad. And what enables us to get there is to make these assumptions on the deflections. These deflections are in 3D. I was able to basically determine a way of tracking the deflections in the mid surface and then determining the deflections are through a thickness by adding this term and we're assuming it's a linear relationship just like in beam theory when you do that you get these five strains that are non-zero you can plug in these strain deflection relationships into a strain energy density so we have this is strain energy density the stress field is this one. I can plug these strains that you see here in here, okay? So I'm going to divide the strain energy into the in-plane strain energy and the transverse shear strain energy. This in-plane strain energy is going to have sigma xx, sigma yy, and gamma x sigma xy, and that will get multiplied by each of this. When I plug it in here, what I can do, I can call this whole vector epsilon bold superscript and this whole vector kappa bold. And so what I get is that I have this vector of stresses and then the strains are these ones and this kappa is this one. Uh, for the shear strains, it's very simple. I have, these are the transverse stresses, which is going to this vector and the strains that I have here go here. Right, so I'm just writing things in a different way for the strain energy to make it very easy. The strain energy of a plate is integrated over the entire volume. So this is the strain energy density I discussed before. Remember, this is strain energy uh, that we broke it up into in-plane and shear following, following this uh, approach that I discussed here. Again, top level view is not necessary for you to understand every single step. Uh, because uh, I have another video lecture that goes into the details of this. But what I want to show you is what the benefit of plate elements are and the assumptions that go behind it. You can see here that none of these quantities, epsilon naught, kappa, gamma, uh, none of these quantities depend on dz. So I can put those outside of the integral. You can see I did it here. Like that. Does not none of this depend on Z, right? 
you can see here that epsilon bold does not depend on z at all. So I can write the strain energy in this manner. And now I can redefine these quantities in here, which I've done. You can see that I've redefined it in this manner. So the integral through the thickness, because that's truly the integral through the thickness here in the z direction, which is through a thickness direction. That's in essence, the integral from minus h half to h half, the stress vector. And that integral here is basically n bold, n x x, n y y, n x y, and we are calling that n bold. So that's the stress resultant in shell elements. Um, and what you see here is that this is not units of force. This is units of force per unit length, which makes total sense because this integral was done only through a thickness. Then I have the integral of the stress Z. That shows up here. You can see that here, that, that term right there. That term is this one. And stress times Z is really a moment. Think about that. So that moment, again, is integrated through a thickness in this manner. And that's how the moment resultant was found. Then you have this integral here also that needs to be done. That integral gives you the transfer shear stresses, loads, I'm sorry, the transfer shear loads, QY and QX. You can see here that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight components of load um, that are resultants, stress resultants. So now that I have that, um, if I substitute it, that this is n bold from this equation, n bold. And I plug in what this is, which is n bold. And I plug in what this is, which is q bold. Then what I have is this equation here. And it's vastly simplified now. So now I have to go and use the constitutive law. And again, top level view, we're not going to extensive details right now. We're just giving the top level view so you understand how the shell elements work. And I'm going to do it for composites. So the stresses in the local material orientation. So one is oriented along the fibers. Two is transverse to the fiber direction. Uh, what we get is what you see right here, right? And we also have the stresses in the transverse direction. So this was already discussed previously. We know what the constitutive law is uh, for three-dimensional domain. So it should be easy to determine what these quantities are because we already covered this. Uh, but this is what we get uh, here. And E11 is a modulus in the, along the fiber direction. E22 is a modulus along the transverse direction. The Poisson ratio is basically measured, is a strain due to load applied in the one direction, uh, divided by the strain along the one direction. So you're measuring the strain in two direction due to load applied in the one direction, and the ratio of the strains, uh, the strain in the two direction divided by the strain in the one direction gives you the Poisson ratio. And then G12 is the implant shear modulus. So here's your four quantities that we need to use. So uh, we have to define, um, so every single one of these will be the same for every ply. But uh, you can fat calculate these things called U1, U2, U3, U4, U5. Again, these are more advanced now, these are composites now. I'm, I'm talking about composites, how to basically calculate the constitutive relationships for composites. This is for single ply but I want to look at what I do when I have multiple plies. So the way to do that is that you have U1, U2, U3, U4, U5. These are invariants. And you know Q1, Q2, Q1, 2, Q6, 6 from these calculations here. So now that you calculate U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, you're ready now to calculate. So basically every ply is going to have a different angle. 
And so you have to calculate the transformation. Um, and so here, what you wanna do is determine what is a transformation in the global orientation system? Because these cues are computed in the local material orientation, but the plies could have, have different angles and we have to refer them to a global orientation, okay? And so how do we do that is using these transformations. Theta is a ply angle because in composite. So here's what we have is that every ply has a different ply angle, theta. And so we have to determine a way of calculating these values. And that's easy to do because I know Q11, Q22, Q12. These are the same for every ply angle. U1, U2, U3, U4, U5 will be the same for every ply. So it should be fairly simple to then So it's fairly simple to calculate these values here given the ply angle. And now what you see here is what looks complex, but it's not complex. It's very easy to calculate. You have to calculate these matrices A, B, and D. This is this is called the so-called A, B, D matrices. A is called extensional stiffness matrix. B is the extensional bending coupling matrix. D is only the bending stiffness matrix. And then this is also an a shear stiffness matrix right here. And notice how we're able to relate NXX, NYY, NXY to the strains in the mid surface and the curvatures. And, and that's exactly what we wanna do because we have eight res resultants and eight different strains. And so this constitutive law allows us to relate those stress resultants to the strains that we need in our calculations. So what is A, B, and D? In essence, what's going on is that you're going to divide the thickness into many plies. You may have five plies, six plies, eight plies, 10 plies. So when you do that, you need to integrate uh, the thickness from bottom to top. But the problem is, so how do you do that? So you have to break up this integral right here from bottom to top into small pieces. So we can then perform that integration through the whole thickness because every ply has different ply angles. You have to calculate Q bar for every ply first. And then, so you know the location of each ply, ZK and ZK minus one. That's basically the location of each of these plies. So, uh, ply number three, Z3 minus Z2, for example, here, you have to do a summation because every ply has a different Q bar. And so I have to sum them up from bottom to top. And I won't go through the revision here. This is done in a different composites video. Again, top level view for now, just so you understand top level and how this element formulation works for composites, um, which is a more general form. And you have here that this values can be easily calculated for the whole ply, ply stacking sequence, because composite laminates are gonna have more than one ply. Once you calculate all this stuff, you can plug it in here and these are just numbers. The A, B, and D are just numbers. The D is a bending stiffness. You can see it has similarities to the um, bending stiffness for beam EI, where I is one over 12 BH cubed. You can see this looks you can see an H cube there, and you can see a third there. So there's some similarities here that are not too far from what you've seen before. Now I'm ready to plug in the constitutive law. So I know how to relate N, M, and Q to the strains. And it turns out that I can write this equation into this format uh, where I'm taking advantage of knowing what A, B, and D are. So I know A, B, and D uh, what I want to do is get rid of this M bold, but I know that M bold and M bold are related to these quantities here. So all we have to do is just substitute it, right? So once we do that, I get this as a strain energy. And for the shear terms, this is strain energy. And now I'm ready to even look at this in a more compact manner. I'll call this column vector strain transpose. This C bold, the stiffness matrix, which is fully known. I know all these numbers and I know all the strains.
and I could apply a load uh, to the top surface like that. Uh, so that's the total potential energy now. And I'm going to define the differential operator that looks like this. Uh, you can you will see if that I can recover each of these quantities. There's eight of them. So the first row times the, that column gives me partial u naught respect to x. That's exactly what that is. And you can see this differential operator works really well. I'll call this L bold and this column vector u bold. So strain bold equals L bold times u bold. All right. So so now we're ready to substitute the relationships here. So the run and risk approximation, the idea is to approximate the solution by selecting approximation for u, v, and w, mc, x, mc, y, and then you take the partial power respect to each of these unknown coefficients and set that equal to zero. But obviously this approach um, is not convenient. It's better to define everything in terms of the nodal coordinates. As a, fun as a consequence, I'm gonna take the five approximation functions and I'll approximate each of them so they're a function of the nodal values. Uh, which are unknown. And then I'll use the idea of the shape functions again. And I'll do that for all five uh, unknowns. These are the five things I want to find in this theory. I can write this as u bold, the shape functions going to m bold, and this is nodal coordinate, nodal values going to q bold. Okay. So the total potential energy becomes this quantity here. I had shown you that earlier. So this E bold, C bold and E bold, I'm just rewriting that here. And if E bold is L bold, U bold, that's E bold, E bold is this. And then U bold is M bold, Q bold, right? So I'm ready now to, to basically, uh, rearrange everything and you can see here i have a q bold uh, this q bold cancels out when i take this partial respect to q uh, and this is what i get for the plate element formulation so i won't go through the derivation of this because that's in my book uh, you can look at that derivation to the fullest extent and with an example we have an example there that walks you with numbers but for this particular course i want to just focus on the application you already learned it. Uh, we, you already learned it using some abacus examples, but I'll show you uh, how to do it in the input deck as well. So, say you have three elements, and I'm going to then study this model. Uh, in this case, I'm going to take this clamped end, clamp it, and apply a load here. So, how does this work? Uh, I'm going to specify the nodal values. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nodes. I'll specify the locations of them. And then I have three elements, one, two, and three. S4 is a plate element, which is going to behave like Reichner Mindling theory, the plate theory. And then I'll connect things. So element number one is connected by nodes one, two, seven, and eight. Element number two is connected by nodes two and three, six and seven. Element number three is connected by nodes three, four, five, and six. And I'm going to use shell elements, uh, which are type S4 in Abacus. I'm also going to define an orientation and I'm going to define the global orientation system. And this is convenient so I can then specify ply angles. So here you can see I'm specifying the X axis as one, zero, zero. And then the Y axis is zero, one, comma, zero. So that's what I'm specifying there. And then I'm telling Abacus that the rotation about the three axis is zero degrees. So the shell section now is defined relative to the global orientation. I'm going to model composites. So that's what why you see composites here. And then every ply, uh, the ply thickness is 0 0.012 uh, and it has three integration points. That's the material of interest. And that's a ply angle, the one you see there, 45 minus 45, 60, 30, and zero. That carbon epoxy material property. So there's basically five plies in this structure. 
the carbon epoxy material property, we're going to use type equals lamina, which allows you to define the modulus along the fiber, 20E6, along the matrix direction, 1E6, Poisson ratio 0.3, shear modulus 7.5E5, and so forth. These are the other transverse shears, and this is implant shear. Usually implant shear is higher. Then I'm going to proceed and run a static analysis. And we're going to apply a load here of 100 pounds and 100 pounds of this node. And that allows you to then solve the problem using the abacus. And you can see that we got a solution. The plate modeling in abacus uh, is uh, we use shell elements to model structures in one dimension. The thickness is smaller than the other two dimensions. The shell elements discretize the, ref the other the reference surface. So we're only discretizing this reference surface and that reference surface is following the three-dimensional behavior. The thickness is specified in the section property definition. You saw that there, we defined it there. Star shell section uh, is the one that we're defining here. You can see here. Shell elements have displacement and rotational degrees of freedom. The top surface of a conventional shell element is labeled as, as pos. The bottom surface is in the negative direction along the normal is referred as as neg. So you can actually specify those surfaces in, in these type of formulations. And so, so what do we have next? We have to look at uh, what other types of element formulations we have. So Abacus has this S8R5W. The eight here means number of nodes. R means reduce integration. Five is an optional approach to have a degree of freedom five. And then here W uh, is an optional approach that Abacus explicitly has to to consider warping, but don't worry about that one. Uh, typically gonna be using S8R, for example. Plate bending in Abacus uh, uses thick conventional shell elements. The thick shells are needed where transfer shear flexibility is important. This occurs when the thickness is more than about one over 15 of a characteristic length. Abacus provides element types uh, S8R and S8RT for use only in thick shell problems. So those are the ones you want to be using. So let's be careful there when you're working on these problems. If you're using very thick elements, make sure you're using the right thing, the right element. Otherwise, you can be in trouble in your solutions. The element types are um, S3, S3R, which is reduced integration, S4, S4R, and so forth, okay? Let's look at S3, that's a triangular three-noted element with Kirchhoff template bending. S4R5 is a quadrilateral four-node element for Kirchhoff template bending, so that's if the plate is fairly thin, it's more computationally uh, uh, less expensive. S8R is a quadrilateral eight noted element, middling thick plate. And S4 is a quadrilateral general purpose finite elements with finite strain. So very good, uh, very good elements they have. The middling plate is similar to Tomoshenko theory. Kirchhoff is similar to Euler Bernoulli beam where the transfer shears are fairly small for thin plates. Five in the element name, as you saw there, it just has a five degree of freedom per node and that's usually using thin shell elements. It just increases accuracy there. Uh, the plate bending in Abacus is a finite strain shell element and accounts for finite rotations. Uh, they're suitable for large strange analyses. Small strain shell elements uh, usually have this R in them. So, you know, uh, have this uh, T or, you know, these are the, small strain elements in general. They uh, allow you to have large rotations, but there's usually small strains. The elements that use the five degree of freedom, the number five there, 
is S for R5 and so forth. You can see a five there. So that's how you know is using the extra degree of freedom to get you better answers. Uh, they're economical models. Um, they only model thin shells. They cannot be used for thick shells and cannot be used for finite strain applications. Although you can model large rotations. With that said, I thank you very much. I hope you're keeping safe and I hope you have a great day. We're winding down in this course and I hope you're learning a lot through the projects or practical projects. Again, I'm not going to have you do this by hand, but I expect everybody here to understand the top level view on how to do this. In real life, you're not gonna write these equations by hand. You're gonna be doing them in the computer code. And so for that reason, uh, we're not going to be doing this. Now, if you wanna learn how to do an example, step-by-step step with numbers in my book, you can go ahead and look at that. I have a few examples there, uh, but for now, let's focus on the projects and uh, finish the quarter strong. Thank you very much and have a great day.